So Pinkesh, I'd like you to introduce our guest speaker today and uh, facilitate today's sessions, please. Thank you. Absolutely, pleasure. Uh, you guys can uh, hear me okay there? Yep. Super. Well, I am particularly interested uh, uh, and super excited for today's session. Uh, not only have I known Shamik for some time, uh, he's one of those uh, individuals who uh, is a very humble uh, and yet super accomplished. Uh, you know, if there is a embodiment of a lot more substance and a lot less sizzle, I think here is the, the epitome and the example of that in this world, uh, a role model to many of us. Uh, you know, Shamik uh, started his career uh, as an engineer, but kind of moved into uh, very rapidly, uh, uh, you know, series of, um, uh, you know, roles uh, in Bay Area startups. Uh, you know, his uh, company got acquired uh, by Oracle, uh, a security software company that he had, uh, 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 you know, he was one of the co-founders. Uh, several senior executive roles um, in uh, uh, across the, the range of industries from ed tech to, uh, to marketplaces, to content publishing, to gaming. Uh, somebody who has, you know, 30 plus patents, uh, you know, uh, uh, who's grown, uh, you know, businesses like Mintra uh, and helped scale uh, it uh, to multifold. Uh, he was the, you know, the CPO and CTO at Mintra. Uh, and right now he's uh, running very, very interesting initiatives uh, at CureFit. Um, as an angel investor who's also invested in several startups, uh, you know it's uh, it's my proud privilege to uh, to kind of introduce uh, Shamik and welcome uh, you to this session. Uh, I understand uh, Shamik that uh, you are a um, an eclectic reader. Um, you know uh, what's what's uh, what's on your reading list right now, especially with the times that we're in right now. I'm reading philosophy, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, right, right time. I think there's a lot more application for it uh, now than ever before. Um, so, so you know, with, without further ado, uh, I want to kind of introduce um, uh, the topic as well. I think uh, it's a fascinating way to start uh, in a in a more action-oriented, applied context of data science, where the topic is about you know several case studies of applied data science in action. Um, and I think uh, you know we certainly look forward, Shamik, to hear uh, more from you, you know, with your experiences with Mintra, with Cult, but even before that, uh, in, in terms of how have you kind of transcended these uh, roles um, and applications of data science in building multi-million dollar businesses, uh, monetizing them, kind of structuring them. But before we do that, uh, I want to put a quick poll uh, for, for your benefit, Shamik, and for the benefit for all of us as we kind of have this opening keynote of this festival for the five days, as I mentioned. Uh, in terms of who is in the audience today. Uh, can we have uh, the poll on the screen? Um, and if everyone can kind of take a quick minute to kind of identify, uh, you know, your role in the context of data. Uh, are you a data analyst, uh, you know, analyzing data, you know, making inferences and kind of living uh, in a day in the life of a data analyst? Are you a data engineer focused on big data uh, and leveraging aspects um, of storing and retrieving? Are you a, a hardcore data scientist, you know, living in the world of mathematics and algorithms and hopefully finding some new cure for COVID? Uh, are, you, are you a data science manager who is probably a combination of, uh, uh, you know, business, technology, and data, uh, perhaps not in a current uh, data role uh, is also another option or other. So these are the options we have on the screen. And um, I think I see 300, uh, uh, 250 plus uh, responses so far. And we'll give another second uh, to, to compile so that I think we have a good idea on, uh, on the audience. Um, okay, so I think let's stop the poll. And uh, now that we've crossed 300, uh, let's see. Uh, so, so it turns out about half of them or slightly more than half are in some kind of uh, you know, you know, data role. Uh, you know, most of them are not uh, Shamik. And so I think hopefully that gives you some perspective uh, even though the context today I know is not going to be hardcore, you know, technology driven, but more so the application of it. I think this is uh, very useful for us to also know uh, who's in the audience, um, you know, here today. Uh, a second quick uh, poll, if I can ask the team to also put in terms of the work experience, uh, in terms of how many years uh, in the industry have people spent here today who've joined us. Uh, if you can kind of put that, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, poll on the screen for us to kind of know uh, the maturity and the level of the audience as well. So it looks like a predominantly, you know, 10 plus years, uh, you know, uh, of experience here so far, uh, as I see the polls number comes in, coming in. Um, and, and I think, Shamik, you know, what, one of the things that I'd like for you to also touch upon is why data science is a, is a relatively, you know, hot buzzword now, but even as a field in the last several years, it's been a very recent, you know, rapid amount of, you know, advancements that have happened from a skill and career perspective. Um, you know, people who have, you know, seven plus, 10 plus years of experience, um, you know, one of the things that I think we always hear in the community uh, is, is how, how do you kind of, uh, how do you adapt to new tricks of the trade, right? Because, you know, it is imperative uh, that data science is not just for geeks. It's data science is not just for data scientists. Uh, I think in some sense, it's also like Excel, you know, a musician cannot live without Excel in today's world, right? And so uh, as data science becomes this ubiquitous tool, irrespective of which profession, which role you play, especially for senior leaders, uh, you know, maybe perhaps some advice as we go in and learn from your examples uh, on what you've seen uh, and, and, and perhaps some actionable uh, advice, uh, some prescriptive guidance on what they could be doing uh, and what they should be doing, uh, you know, perhaps uh, when you are five plus years or 10 plus years of experience uh, in a certain domain, a certain zone, right? So, so without further ado, uh, kind of let me uh, send it over to our, you know, star speaker of the show, uh, Shamik, all yours. Thank you, Pikesh. I hope I'm audible. People can hear me. Absolutely. Loud and clear. Great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, this seems to work about 50% of the time. So just let me know if it's working. Um, can yeah, we, see? Can see, we can see the screen. Great. And is this a presentation mode? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so well, just a second, I'm presenting the wrong slide deck here. Just give me a second. So while uh, you know Shamik pulls up the the deck, uh, I'd strongly encourage uh, you know all of you to get up and close and this opportunity to ask questions. You know one of the things that we always encourage is you know by practitioners for practitioners and um, and so put your questions in that LinkedIn thread. I think that was shared earlier. Uh, I, I did recognize that some of you had put the comments that it's uh, it's hard to copy paste that URL. Uh, you know, but try to take the short URL perhaps. And um, you can also search Shamik uh, uh, and Product Leadership Festival or Institute of Product Leadership, uh, you know, hashtag on LinkedIn, and you'll find that thread. So you know, certainly start pouring your questions as well as we get to the later part of our uh, of our talk, so that we can uh, bring your questions into the live session here today. Great. We can uh, we can see your session. We can see your uh, uh, presentation in uh, in uh, in full screen mode now. Great. So I'm going to try and um, maybe speak for about 30, 40 minutes, and um, I'll take questions uh, towards the end. Uh, primarily, not you know, I actually like a more interactive sessions, but on Zoom, it's a little bit harder to do that. And secondly, um, this this uh, presentation is more of a story. I'm going to make a case for something that is not yet true, but I think is going to be true. Um, and for that story to evolve and come out. I need to kind of um, talk about uh, the, the, the key point at the end. Um, and before you kind of hear the key point, I think it'll be, um, uh, it'll be awkward to take questions. Um, so let's uh, go through the slides. There aren't too many. Um, and uh, then at the end, we will take all the questions, okay? So uh, first, an introduction about me. I think Pinkesh has already told you about me, I'm, I've had two, you know, if I look at my career, it's basically in two decades. Um, the last decade, 2000 to 2010, was in the Bay Area, approximately, and then the last decade has been in Bangalore. And I started out as an academic, as a research scientist um, in HP Labs and in the University of Maryland, where I was uh, writing papers, patents, and stuff like that. And then you can't stay in the Bay Area without getting sucked into the entrepreneurial vortex. So I founded a security software company. Um, and then I joined Yahoo for a while. And that was my switch from enterprise software to consumer software. 
And then after that, I've been at many startups inside the Valley, including social gaming marketplaces, advertising, uh, and including a camera hardware company where I built a, a light field camera. And then um, moved here in the early part of this decade. Um, and I was uh, for most of this period for about seven years was the chief technology and product officer at Mintra. Um, we went through quite a, a eventful journey there. And then uh, for a couple of years after that, I was uh, both just an angel investor investing in companies, but also running a venture studio called Craftworks Lab, where I was, uh, you know, starting up projects, investing in projects and building them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the examples I give. Most recently for the last two years, I have been at CureFit, um, which is a health tech company. Um, might be well known to you guys. We run a lot of fitness centers, food, teleconsultation clinics, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my background. And the reason I'm explaining this background is because what I speak of will be uh, colored by my own biases and experiences in both the Bay Area and Bangalore. Okay. So while I will talk about examples in data science, I want to tell a larger, deeper story of what I see is happening. Um, and this is kind of, uh, this slide is gonna set that up. And this is what I have seen software evolve as over the last 20 years. So in the late 90s, when I joined the workforce, um, software used to be, and in the mid 90s, early 90s, this was more true. Um, the internet quite, wasn't quite there, or at least wasn't penetrated uh, deeply. And most people had desktop software, both at companies as well as individually. Um, and they were mostly tools. I mean, you use things for productivity, invoicing tools or um, you know, solving point problems. And then um, if you look at how it evolved on the top, you see the B2B side of things. B2B started moving into more productivity tools, things like Lotus Notes and spreadsheets and stuff like that. And on the consumer side, we started evolving into the computer and software providing information. So we saw Yahoo, Google, and companies of that sort providing informational services to you. And then communications tools started coming out, email, Lotus Notes, et cetera, on the, on the, in the B2B side on top, and similarly chat, um, social networks, et cetera, on the consumer side. You could now connect with friends and on the, on the on the top side, you see that you know companies could now talk to customers. So you had companies that like Siebel and so on coming up with CRM tools, marketing tools, and so on. Google providing advertising networks. And most recently, we've seen collaboration software coming out very strongly in the enterprise, while consumers have been using software to entertain themselves with Netflix, games, and so on. And now we're evolving to where services are available on via software. And by services, I mean things like Swiggy, e-commerce, et cetera. And on the, the enterprise side, that means things like finance tools or you know, supply chain as a service or warehousing as a service, et cetera. And the open question for us is, as we evolve like this, what's next? And this uh, presentation is a little bit about what my hypothesis is about what comes next. See, one key shift that has happened over the last 10 years is that while software used to be considered as primarily digital services, so if you look at entertainment, social networking, email, communication tools, information networks, these are all digital services. Even the initial services that came out um, like Make My Trip or Expedia, they were providing something that wasn't a physical good at your doorstep. It provided a PDF of a ticket or so on. But recently we've now moved to digital services, right? The non-digital services. And this is a very significant change um, that uh, I have experienced personally from moving from working the first decade in the Bay Area on primarily just digital services to Mintra where this problem was very, very physical. So um, a step back, this is a saying by Paul Coelho um, and it's pretty famous. It says that when you really want something all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. And it seems like pretty philosophical, right? It means that if you really want something, things will you know, kind of conspire to make it happen. And what have we used it for? And if you look at it, this has actually happened. It's true today, except it's in a very mundane fashion. I want a pizza, 
I press some buttons on a device and lo and behold, somebody somewhere out there is starting to make a pizza and a motorcycle starts up and a delivery boy whips that pizza over through traffic into my doorstep. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the fact that you wanted a pizza and suddenly the universe has conspired to help you achieve eating that pizza, right? So, I mean, the same thing with Uber. You know, I press a button and somewhere a car moves, comes over to my doorstep, picks me up, takes me somewhere. This is quite incredible, right? It's just that we've gotten so used to it that we don't think of how incredible this uh, achievement is that the last 10 years has brought upon us, right? So I think what we have now, you know, kind of achieved is when you want stuff, stuff comes to you. Of course, we're talking of the, the people who can afford it, but from a technology perspective, this is quite possible today. The whole supply chain, procurement, logistics, all of that is now doable. What's next is um, you now want people. If you think of yourself as a king of this new world, you wanted stuff and stuff comes to you. What can come next is people. I want people to do stuff for me, right? And that is what this um, you know, presentation is about. So here's the problem that will come about when I, you know, uh, you know, put forward this hypothesis of how people will come and help you, right? The problem is that when we started off with tools, they scale well. Content scales perfectly. You make a content once, it, you can show it to as many people as you want. Making Game of Thrones is quite, you know, it's, it's difficult, but once you do it, 100 million people watch it, right? Services, you know, they scale but not so much, right? You know, no, you know, it's, it's very hard to make a services company that has actually become profitable yet. And Amazon is one, Alibaba is another, but if you look at Swiggy, Mintra, Flipkart even, it hasn't yet, you know, become profitable, but there is hope. It's still early days yet in this industry, right? But one thing we do know for sure is that people don't scale. If I provide a person to you, then, it's not possible for me to provide that same person to a million other people, right? And this is the fundamental problem that we'll be talking about um, today. So we're gonna keep that thought in the back burner for a while, and I'll come to the main point of the talk, and I'll give you some examples of data science and action that I have personally been involved in over the last 10 years. And then we will come back to the question that I asked about what is next? How do people services expertise get provided to you at low cost in a scalable manner, right? And my hypothesis is that this is the problem to solve for the next decade, all right? So first example, this is Mintra. So in Mintra, the, the, the way that fashion industry works is it's a very long lead cycle. So the way it works is that a designer designs a piece of garment. Then you have a road show where the, the person who designed it, the brand usually, will go and show it to retailers and say, hey, do you like this shirt? I'm gonna make a million pieces of it if you place an order, right? And then if you get the orders, then you make it, and then you retail it. And seven times out of 10, people hate that product. So it's a ripped T-shirt, ripped jeans work, but ripped T-shirts don't work. So you've got you know, so many thousands and thousands of pieces of a t-shirt lying in waste in your warehouse. And that's why you see the discounts and end of season sales and so on, right? So in order to solve this problem at Mintra, what we tried to do was think about whether we can shorten this 12 month cycle into a two month cycle where you design and make stuff within and get it to retail on Mintra in a two month period. Now, in order to do this, the design cycle cannot take three months. The design cycle has to be done in a few days, maybe four or five days, right? And as soon as you get data in October about what's gonna work in this winter period, you have to be able to design it within a week. You have to be able to manufacture it within two weeks so that you still have two months of that season to sell the product in. So in order to do this at Mintra, we did this project called Rapid, which said that we are going to automate fashion design. Right? 
And, uh, you know, the way it worked was both you took the top seller, bottom seller sales data from Mintra, Jabong, Flipkart, all the group companies, and you put it into a AI designer, which would look at all the attributes of all the products that were for sale, whether half sleeves work better, short sleeves work better, what kind of print pattern works, the colors and so on, what works and what doesn't work. And the designer automated system would create designs and you keep on churning at it and looking at the sales data and saying, if I produced a shirt like this, and this is design iteration number 20, it would look very terrible, right? But you could keep on cranking at it. And this would how the t-shirts used to look at design iteration 100, 300, and then it picks the best of those and it creates designs like this, right? And could even give a score. What is the likelihood of this shirt be becoming a top seller? and say, okay, this is the likelihood is 70%. These are some examples of the machine generated designs that actually got made. There is a brand, you can go to Mintra even today and buy this brand called Moda Rapido. This is an in-house brand. There is no designer working on this brand, by the way. It was launched in 2015. 30 days from concept to go live means the product is already manufactured, which is one fifth of the fastest other industry averages, companies like Zara, et cetera. It gives 3X the rate of sale of any other brand on Mintra and 2X the gross margins because you'd spend much less time on inventory holding, mark, you know, moving the products from one warehouse to the other to a point where it sells. Um, and today it makes over $100 million in revenue for Mintra. Okay? So this is one example. Second example. This is a company that was incubated in Craftworks, my venture studio. And the, the product is called SpaceJoy. You can go to spacejoy.com. And it's a service for US customers mostly that designs a room for you, right? So the way it works is you upload some pictures of the room you want to decorate or get an interior designer for. You enter the dimensions of that room. A designer will call you and ask you a little bit about your tastes and what colors you like, et cetera. And in two days, the designer will send you a design. So that seems pretty easy to do. You just need a marketplace of designers um, and you know a designer can work on their own tools and get you a design. But here's what's interesting, right? So this is the kind of designs you get on Space Joy, right? Which is a 3D model, it's a, it looks very real. It must take the designer a lot of time to create this. Typically a designer that uh, does this will take about a week and charge about a thousand dollars in the US. It can range up to $5,000 for a, a, a large, expensive, you know, complicated design. But in that range of a thousand to five thousand dollars, here's how much it does cost. $49, right, on Space Jar. How does this happen? Well, there's a lot of automation that goes behind the scenes. Um, you enter your floor plan, which can either be your, you know, a 2D model or it can just be pictures. The system automatically creates a 3D model out of this, of your house or your room. And then it fills it in with products that it knows it should, that, uh, that will fit in the room and according to the taste expressed by the user. And then the designer comes in and just tweaks a bunch of stuff. And it, uh, the designer, what usually takes about three to four days, a lot of which is grunt work, by the way, in just placing stuff, putting the lighting, shadows, texture, and so on. All of that is automated. And a designer can complete the interior design in two hours. Right? And that is why it costs $49 rather than a few thousand dollars. Okay. Third example, Kubrick.io, yet another company that uh, we worked on in the venture studio. It's an automated video editor, right? So here's the use case. You have catalog images on Mintra or Flipkart or any website you go to, similar to this, like this is an example of a bike. And typically a company that sells bikes like Decathlon does would have hundreds of these bikes or at least dozens. And every one of these bikes would need a video of this sort, right? So I hope that video was visible. 
So what Kubrick does is it automates video creation of this sort. Um, it, uh, you just give it one video of one byte and it figures out, okay, so you want to spin the wheel, you want to spin the pedal, you want to tell the dimensions of the wheel. Um, here's what you want to do. So it looks at one of such, one created video like this by a human, and it automatically does the same thing for all the other items in your catalog that match it, right? So again, it takes what should have taken a video editor at least a couple of hours, if not days, and just does all of that in seconds. So, you know, externally in the US, creating a video like that, each video would cost you about $50. And Kubrick does that for $1 per video. Fourth example, this is a cult live. Um, this is a cure fit for people who are working out with cure fit at home. They would be familiar with this. This allows you to work out interactively at home. And the interaction part is that the camera on your phone watches you. You can see the guy with the blue shirt on the top right. That's the person uh, using this application. And it gives you a score at the bottom bar, which is called the energy meter. And this energy meter then tracks your motions and gives you a score, which allows you to then compete with other people and get a very gamified experience. But it's not just that. It's like a fitness trainer who is actually watching over you because after the class, um, we send you a lot of reports saying, here's what your workout plan should be. Here are the poses you need to correct. If it's yoga, for example, these are the areas in which you are strong. These are areas in which you can improve. Here are some video snippets of what the motion should be like versus your motion how you've improved over time, and even motivational messages about what you did well and how you can do better, right? And all of this is through um, a pose detector uh, algorithm that runs on your phone and tracks all your joints and limbs, okay? So I'll pause here, and then I'm going to talk about takeaways. So, and come back to the, the slides I had come at the beginning, right? So these are some examples, but I'm coming back to this slide and I'll, and, and I'll connect the, the examples I gave to the message I had in the beginning, right? But at this moment, I'll just pause and uh, see if there are any questions. Shamik, there are several questions coming in, uh, but I think uh, we can continue and probably take those questions at the end, uh, if you will. Yeah, I think that's a better idea. Shamik, go ahead. Hello, guys. Audible? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear us, Shamik? Hello. Can you say that again? Sorry, Pinkesh. Hey, uh, what, what we're saying is that I think we'll take the questions at the end. Okay. So so go ahead and, uh, you know, don't stop your train of thought. Okay. Right. This is pretty exciting. Great. So um, what we have covered is some examples. And uh, just uh, with my chat window here. So the key takeaways from this, right? So the first thing is that I argue that what we think as creative skills can actually be packaged as a service. But this packaging is not easy. It needs new product skills that people need to develop. And just like in each of the other iterations as we develop from tools to services, uh, we needed to develop new product skills. Similarly, in order to be able to build these services, um, creative skill services, we need very new kinds of skills that many of us uh, will need to retrain ourselves on. And the key insight here is that what customers want is they want the human touch but they want it at the low price of technology, right? And this is the challenge that the product manager faces when they are just trying to combine technology and product into a package that works for the customer. Okay. Um, I'm going to step back a bit and talk a little bit about what I've observed over the last 20, 30 years. And this slide is actually a chart from our world in data.org. And what it does is it tracks how 
goods have either increased or decreased in price over the last 20 years. And what you can notice is that some things have actually become cheaper and some things have become much, much more expensive. And if you look at what is the common thing that has gone up in price, these are things that need humans, education, healthcare, food, transportation, right? Whereas goods, products, software, electronics, toys, TVs, etc., they have actually become cheaper, right? So making stuff, which is what we have been good at for the last 10 years, is actually becoming deflationary. It's not going to be a very profitable venture for people to start companies in or build products for. What we need to build products for are human related services, such as education, healthcare, food services, et cetera. So this is what I believe the next step will be. This is what I call expertise as a service, where instead of software as a service, you're providing some kind of human expertise as a service. So in the B2B world, this means that what you thought of as tools for finance, tools for marketing, et cetera, will actually become a marketing video creator or a legal advisor, a, an email writer, right? The content writer, the fund manager, instead of thinking of tools for people, you're thinking of the people themselves as software. And similarly in the B2C world, things which are tools for us will now be replaced, not replaced, but substituted and added by people that we think are needed, but now available as services over the internet. And this includes things like fitness trainers, doctors, designers, teachers, therapists, wealth advisors, and so on. Many, many other examples here. And these are all the people, it's almost like you are a, um, you're a, you're a billionaire and you have this whole retinue of people who are there to help you. And imagine how much more productive and how easier life would be if you had all of these people at your beck and call. Right? And that is the future I think we're headed down towards. This is the, how the, you know, the business model works, which is that you know, customers today pay a lot of dollars to talk to experts of, of the kinds that we talked about before, which is why only the very rich people have access to them. Most people here would not have a personal trainer, and yet those people that do have a personal trainer can vouch for how effective it is and how they're able to live a very fit life because they have a person who watches over their health every day. But if we were to make that accessible at one-tenth the price, by providing expertise as a service, by some smart combination of AI and a human, then a lot more customers would use these services. Many of us would not think of using an interior designer just to design a room, and we live with the crappy room that we have. But if that room can be redesigned by somebody for a fraction of the price that you imagine it will take, just imagine how many more people will redesign their rooms. So these are the big opportunity areas that I see in the next decade. Health and wellness, education, marketing, legal and financial services. These are all places where a lot of humans are involved and a lot of expertise is imparted from one person to the other. And um, I think all of these are amenable for providing expertise as a service. But in order to do so, we need very different kind of product thinking. So instead of thinking as what do I provide as a service, the product feature is all about providing expertise. And the design problem, the UX or the product design problem is how do you make it feel human even if most of the work is, doing, is being done in, in an automated fashion. And the differentiation between products that are competing in this market will be about how much emotional connect are you able to generate at scale. And the pricing power comes from how much investment the customer is willing to make in your product because the differentiation comes from the emotional connect. So how much emotional investment are they willing to make? And how does your product allow them to make that emotional connect and emotional investment? Happy to talk about that because this is a pretty um, complex topic uh, about how you differentiate in a world where expertise itself is becoming commoditized. 
So this is my last slide. And the point I would like to make is just like the industrial revolution 150 years ago, automated physical labor, but it created a lot of jobs for people who could work with machines. I believe that the data science revolution is going to automate expertise, but it will create a lot of jobs for people who are willing to work with data science and AI, but not in the, the mundane way that people often think about it, which is that, oh, I need to learn data science, I need to learn deep learning, and I need to learn about TensorFlow and so on. All of that is important, but there is, uh, if you think of all of that as a commodity, there's a lot of product expertise and product skills as well that needs to be born, uh, needs to be brought to bear in order to really solve these problems. So that's all um, that I had. Um, I hope that uh, I have stressed upon the key point I'm trying to make, which is that we're headed for a world where expertise is becoming a service and data science has a big role to play, but so does product thinking and product design. That is just absolutely brilliant. Uh, very, very thought provoking, uh, Shamik. Um, I can see the question board is uh, lighting up now with a lot of questions, but I think before I jump to those, uh, you know, I, I had a, uh, a quick question myself. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, the gig economy. And, and while this gig economy context is not in connection with AI and data science, but this whole freedom of being wherever you are, whoever you are, and kind of, uh, as opposed to working for someone full time, you're available for a slice of your time, right? In fact, you know, thanks to Uber, uh, this whole thing uh, got accelerated in the Bay Area at least, um, you know, 10 years ago. And I think we're seeing a lot more now in India, uh, you know, thanks to, uh, thanks to the individual, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of employees, but still on contract, right? You know, working professionals, but still working on their own time, their own style, their own uh, decision. And, and I'm sure, you know, you've kind of generated a whole, uh, with cult, you know, a whole set of kind of fitness professionals who are now, you know, becoming freelancers in some sense and kind of, you know, doing what they do. So are you, are you implying that this whole expert as a service is on the foundation of a model called gig, gig economy already that, was, that we've seen as established, or are you seeing that uh, getting disrupted, uh, you know, with this new X as as you as you is that how you pronounce that? By the way, that's a it's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. How how do you see the two work together? Yeah, see, the way I see the gig economy is that um, much of the logistical human involvement, right? Things which are you know, cooking food, delivering. Um, products from one place to the other, moving stuff, uh, warehousing, you know, motions, et cetera. I think um, all of that is what I look at the gig economy. And I think that these are not places where expertise is really needed. So these will um, become quickly, not quickly, but you know, maybe in a decade or two will become automated in the sense that there will be automated cars, warehousing is already becoming automated with robotics in China. You rarely see a warehouse worker nowadays. Um, and similarly, I think delivery robots, drones, et cetera, will soon take over that part of the gig economy. And I think people, um, while that will cause a lot of employment issues, I don't think from a just technology or a product point of view, that is a very unforeseeable future. I think people have kind of reconciled themselves with the fact that this will probably happen, right? What I think people are not seeing is that that aspect of the gig economy and expertise as a service will come and pervade all our lives, even in the skills that we think are not um, amenable for um, data science to play a role in. And this includes things like doctors, engineers, software creation, movie making, acting, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this will be a slow, steady process and um, it will be more like you know, augmentation in the beginning, but slowly replacing more and more of the grunt work of people until a point comes where you know, that person is no longer needed. Fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of questions. I have a few, but I'm gonna hold on to mine. Uh, I'm gonna switch to uh, some of the audience questions. I think Anju, uh, Anju Agrawal has a good question. I think she 
uh, is very curious that you know while you showed uh, an amazing you know uh, you know movie if you will right you know of all these things happening uh, especially your t-shirt and, and how mintra was able to automate and cut down the cycle and it's almost like the machine is generating the designs which are going to have high probabilistic sales um, can you walk us through maybe a little bit about how you got in the making of that movie right you know how before you can have, and, and of course i'm sure it's a, it's a long process and it may take a longer time to explain but can you kind of give some highlights and insights into what kind of systems uh, did you have to put in place um, internally for mintra in this in that particular case study for it to actually materialize uh, for these business models to work yes so by the way you know uh, I, you know, I've, I've played both a technologist role and a product person's role uh, throughout my career. And um, I would think of myself as a product person first, right? Mm -hmm. So while I'm painting a picture that might seem um, very, you know, futuristic and technologically advanced, you know, I don't, you know, approach products um, from that perspective. Okay, I have a piece of fascinating technology. How do I apply it, right? So um, I would like to think of always a product as, um, here's what the customer wants and how do I provide that and how do I use technology? Um, like if you look at SpaceJoy, for example, nowhere does it say AI. We don't use the word AI at all. Um, in Kubrick, we never use the word AI unless it's to pitch to an investor, right? So the customer has to feel that actually a human is doing it. And the mm -hmm. fact that you're able to do it faster, cheaper, the customer really doesn't care. In fact, they don't want to hear that this was designed by a machine. They want to hear that this fashion, that shirt that I'm wearing, was designed by a designer. Everyone wants to hear that, right? So in order to do that, right, the problem that we were trying to solve was not to say, okay, how can I design a t-shirt by a machine? The problem we were trying to solve was, how do I make a t-shirt that is going to sell well and do that within a month, right? And in order to do that, you have to look through every part of that cycle. The designer actually is not the biggest part of that cycle. The designer in a normal period of a 12 month cycle takes about a month, right? Um, the making is, and, and the selling part of it is what takes the most time. So behind the scenes at Mintra, we had to work a lot on how do we shrink the supply chain part of it? And I mean by that the procurement supply chain. So a lot of tricks went in towards prefetching fabric. So for example, you would tell that, you know, I, I'm gonna make a bet. I don't know what kind of t-shirts are gonna work this year, what colors are going to work but I'm going to get gray fabric that can be easily dyed into many separate colors. And I'm going to stock up the gray fabrics in all of my, um, in all of my textile mills beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pick maybe the top 10 color dyes and I'm going to procure them in advance. And now the reason why you know, the system is more important that AI design is so important is that if you tell a human designer, oh, by the way, I know you want to design X, but sorry, I only have these 10 colors. You have to design it with those 10 colors. Human designers, you know, are creative folks. They don't like to operate within these uh, very narrow boundaries, especially if you give them 20 attributes saying, it has to be half sleeve, it has to have a button of this color, it has to have these colors only, it has to have this fabric, et cetera, et cetera. Those, you know, the number of parameters that a human would have to think about to design within those constraints would be impossible. And this is why the AI designer works because it can take all of these complex constraints into account and say, oh, if you're constraining me within all of this, then this is the design that I can make and this you can produce within a week. Interesting. So kind of start, start from that end goal in mind and then kind of work through your processes internally to make sure that you use and leverage the right um, uh, set of technology perhaps to, to achieve that, right? Uh, um, in so, fact, uh, yeah, so yeah. one point here, right, you know, so when a product person thinks of all of this, right, the problem today is that if you're a product manager and you're thinking that, oh, I need to do X, Y, Z, the place where people kind of stop and don't jump across the chasm is that they think that, oh, this thing can only be done by a human, so it's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to ask everybody around me is to take that flying leap of faith, that what you think so if you said I could do the procurement beforehand, I can get the gray fabric, I can get the dyes, I can do it, but oh shit, my designer cannot do it in less than a month. Mm. And that's the part that most people would have stopped at. And at Mintra we said, no, actually even design, fashion design can be done by a machine. And mm. that's the last step that kind of unlocks the value. 
Fascinating. Uh, in fact, Rishi uh, from the audience has a very uh, related question, um, and and I think his his view or or his question is, you know, how do you convince a set of people internally, uh, right? Because I'm sure everybody may not see uh, for a for a brand new vision like this for the first time when you're introducing something. Uh, I'm sure there are others in the organization who may not see. Uh, the vision, the the value, uh, the clarity with which perhaps a data science professional uh, or a data product manager is going to present these ideas with. Uh, and, and so a lot of times you get into this difficulty of getting this type of data science feature approved, if you will, right? Uh, in fact, uh, related to that, uh, I'd also like to maybe throw up a poll. Uh, and, and so the question for you, Shamik, is, you know, what do you think has been in your experience, in your, uh, you know, long history of having working with data science driven products, the kind of biggest difficulty in getting these data science projects, uh, data science features, data science, you know, uh, new subsystems approved internally, right? You know, with your management team, with investors um, and, and so on and so forth. So before you answer that, uh, let's kind of throw up that poll uh, to, to the audience and, 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 and let's see what the, the group thinks here as to what are the most, uh, actually, no, that's the, that's the wrong poll. Can you, uh, can, you use, uh, can you use the poll which has the biggest difficulty in getting data science feature? I think poll 17. Okay, looks like there's a number mismatch. Uh, can you remove this poll and uh, put the put the poll for the the project of data science, uh, you know, and what are the difficult, uh, you know, what are the difficulties in typically convincing somebody internally? Uh, perhaps while you guys figure out on the poll question, um, I'll let Shamik first answer that, and then I'm gonna see what the audience thinks as well. Sure. See, um, one of the merit benefits of having a long career is that you know you've seen these uh, changes in the technology world come many times. Um, not that every technology change you know, has a big impact, but when mobile came, when the internet and software as a service came and cloud computing came and all of these things came, it was no different as a problem in order to convince people of the change that is upon us, right? Um, you know, I, I know that many of you may remember when Mintra went mobile only, um, that was pretty hard as well. I mean, you know, people would disbelieve that mobile would become the primary way of doing shopping, right? Um, and uh, now I expect that, you know, in, you know, if you did a poll now of how many people shop from their laptops versus how many people shop from their mobile devices, I think that number would be well over 95%, right? Mm. So, and yet convincing that was no easier. And I think that that is kind of the product manager's job at mm. every point when they see the technology trend shifting to be able to make the case of where the future lies and what is the product that makes sense in this new world, right? So I think data scientists have uh, no different a problem. It's not more acute. Um, in fact, you know, if any, there's a lot of uh, social buy-in of the fact that data science is important. So I think they have an advantage compared to the previous waves of technology changes that have come before us. It of course does need um, a lot of evangelizing, uh, setting out the vision and explaining the product. Um, and there are a lot of tools that help any product manager. This is you know, presentation skills, making up mocks, um, getting stakeholder buy-in through presentation, having a strong business model behind it, et cetera. So, so you're saying that you know, even though it's a data science specific you know, ask, um, your usual stakeholder management, you know, leading by influence, uh, your ability to tell a story, I think is all still very, very strongly relevant, um, you know, even in this case as well. But, but you know, but I always thought that, you know, uh, unlike, unlike other business decisions, you know, data science is a uh, slightly more unpredictable in terms of how long will it take for that model to fine tune, right? Um, while there are a lot of unpredictability in all parts of the business, uh, don't you think there is a, a higher degree of uncertainty, if I can use that word, um, and hence making it increasingly difficult? Uh, add to that, sometimes, now uh, you may be fortunate to, to work with Mukesh and many such stalwarts, your, you know, yourself kind of having 
um, having surrounded by smarter people. But, but what about people who, who are working in a traditional organization where data science is so new to the management team, perhaps? While it's a, a board boardroom buzzword, uh, you know, putting up half a million dollars for an investment for something that has potentially unpredictable timelines to deliver and un, unproven, you know, business models to show. Um, do, do you see that any difficult, any differently difficult, or do you still see uh, that's that's no different than a typical product case that you have to make? Yeah, I actually don't see it as different. I do think that the way you evangelize it is a slightly different. So. And I think that is a, a something that the data scientists themselves need to learn, right? I, I see that as a message, not as a problem with the board and the stakeholders. I see that as a problem that I see in many data scientists and data folks, which is that they start, and this has been true for every technology change that has come in the past as well. You look at it as a technology reason for doing it, saying, I need to train these models, I need to do this without being very clear about what is the business benefit, right? And how is this product going to be used by the user? So um, the user, the customer actually doesn't give a damn about whether it is data science or AI or whatever, right? So they just want to get that interior design. They just want a good looking t-shirt. They just want a, a nice catalog video. They just want to be able to do their fitness class and have it have good data coming on. it. They don't care about it's an AI fitness trainer or what. So. And I think what we tend to do is to not evangelize that end value proposition, but instead we talk about why it is data science, right? So um, I would encourage all the folks here not to, to give up their um, data science ivory tower position and to think about um, the, the problem in mundane worlds of the user and to think about then about, you know, to solve it in the best way possible. And if data science has a role to play there, that's great. But if you can solve the problem without data science, do that. Interesting. Uh, uh, and by the way, now we can kind of share the, the, the poll results. Uh, you can kind of see on the screen uh, what the sentiment in the group here is uh, with about 450 people um, you know, sharing their, their view. Uh, and, and, and it turns out that you know, one of the highest uh, uh, factor, at least on their mind, is this whole uh, which I also had uh, have heard this many times, Shamik, is that you know this lack of tangible business revenue projection or or the ability to be to to communicate that tangible business revenue projections and ROI, uh, I think is the biggest uh, biggest hurdle for a lot of these data science school features still sitting in the labs and never kind of making it out, uh, in, in, you know, beyond just an experiment, right? So uh, so it's fascinating. Uh, you, you know, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about this, uh, this new uh, energy meter and this new cool, it seems like we're kind of living inside, inside an Xbox now, right? we're gonna, you know, we are, we, we are part of the character of this game looks like. Uh, and I also like the fact that you continuously are stressing that there has to be this human emotional connect, uh, as, as opposed to kind of doing things uh, in an automated way, where there's a self-guided way or a chatbot type of thing, um, or a robot trying to guide you. There's a, this element of an instructor who's kind of out there uh, still working with you. What has, I, I'm sure it's early enough, uh, but at the same time, I'm sure COVID has uh, potentially accelerated this experiment of yours uh, to kind of give more, um, you know, uh, kind of tailwind to, 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 to try this out. What has been the results so far? And and, and what are the two things that you feel, uh, uh, you know, could fail uh, that you continuously are watching for as you design these hypotheses and these experiments uh, on what you think will work and what will not? Correct. So, um, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, obviously, CureFit and many other companies, all of us out there are facing a very uh, once in a lifetime situation in terms of um, COVID. And this is going to impact every business. But I think what it has given tailwinds for is any business that is primarily digital connectivity, right? Whether it is Zoom or Hangouts or um, meetings like this, or you know, education or fitness classes online, right? And uh, we had not intended to launch this product um, yet. Um, we were actually planning to launch it in a bigger way in the second half of this year. Um, but the, the situations developed such that we expedited and we've launched it in a, with, uh, with many features still missing and still to come. 
right? But you actually hit the nail on the head. We want you to feel as if you're in a game. Right? Um, and it's a game, it's like a movie in which you are a part of it. Mm. And uh, when the product kind of comes out in its full glory, hopefully you will get that feeling more and more so. Um, but the idea is that you should feel as if, um, not that there is a bot that is watching you and giving you data, which a lot of, uh, I think that's the mistake that a lot of data scientists um, do, right? Which is, oh, we have all this data, let's science it, right? And uh, that's not what people are looking for. People are looking for having, um, doing workouts, feeling good and having fun, right? So you have to use data science to make that happen. And uh, the key insight is that today there's a lot of fitness videos online. You can go to YouTube and, you know, there's like a thousands of videos that you can work out with, with very good training. But none of them is interactive. It doesn't, you know, no matter whether you do a poor workout or a heavy workout, you work out more or less, the world doesn't change. Nobody recognizes that fact. Right? Mm. So just applauding you when you do well and giving you a little slap on the wrist when you're not doing well completely changes the name of the game and you feel involved. Right? Absolutely. And, and that is uh, what the energy meter and all the other science behind it is trying to do. And by the way, I feel the same thing will happen in education as well. Yeah. Today, it's all just one way content delivery and the recipients of any education, and I've done many online courses and my kids do online courses. And I feel that product innovation there has really stopped, right? And you're just kind of blasting one way con you know, information from one side to the other and not caring about the other person. And um, I think a lot of similar product innovation needs to happen where you're making the other person on the other side of the screen involved in the process. Very true, very true. I think, uh, you know, almost 92% dropping of your courses uh, on large platforms like Coursera is also a symptom of that. So super, I think we're just about uh, out of time, uh, but that was a fantastic um, conversation. I think, thanks a lot, uh, Shamik. Um, I know uh, Puneet, uh, our, our uh, next star is already here. Uh, but before that, um, again, wanted to give uh, a big, uh, a big round of applause and thank you for sharing those insights.